Hello, I'm Michael Lieberman, food and beverage practice leader at Foe and Son Insurance Brokers. Uh, thanks to all who have joined us via Zoom and thanks to those who are catching this episode of Food for Thought on Facebook Live. Uh, I would also like to take this time to introduce my guests. Uh, I have Don Murnane uh, here with us and John Kerpusis. I know John's having a little difficulty connecting, so we'll see if he's able to connect. But Don Bernane and John Kerpusis from Freehill, Hogan and Mahar. Uh, gentlemen, welcome and thank you for being here on episode eight of Food for Thought. Thanks for having us, Michael. It's good to see you, John. I'm glad you, I'm glad you were able to get in. We were having some uh, difficulties there. And yeah, Don, I'm actually in the office too, right? So. And you're in the office, good for you. Uh, Don, you are far from being in the office. You're joining us from a very remote location. Uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time to be be here with us today. Well, you're very welcome and fingers crossed on the technical side. That's right. We will keep our fingers crossed. Well, last week, uh, Don, John, and I, we recorded our discussion and we'll get to that recording shortly. Uh, while we spent a good portion of our talk on the headline event in the shipping industry, which was the ever given blockage of the Suez Canal. I believe the most important important takeaway for our audience is the knowledge that Don and John shared as it relates to maritime laws and how those laws can impact the risk management strategies of cargo owners. Uh, following the recorded discussion, John and Don uh, will field your questions live. So to our audience, please uh, share any questions that you may have utilizing the Q&A tool in Zoom. Uh, we'll also be monitoring questions on Facebook Live uh, Patty Devine, Patty, are you here with us? Hi, Michael. Hello, Patty. So Patty, who is so instrumental in putting all of this together, uh, she will be moderating the Q&A. So she's going to be looking for anyone who, who uh, writes their questions in the Q&A tool on Zoom. She'll also be monitoring Facebook Live, uh, and she'll moderate the Q&A at the end of our call. Um, so really, that's all the housekeeping notes. We have a lot a lot of great information coming your way. I want to get to that and be sensitive to the time, try to squeeze all this in and under. So for now, I would ask everyone to do thought. Every week, there seems to be a new story concerning some type of maritime incident, with the recent Suez Canal blockage being one of the most infamous maritime events in history. Cargo owners have had plenty on their plate to deal with, simply due to supply chain complications resulting from COVID-19 production issues, change in consumer demand and increased freight costs. So when cargo becomes damaged or is delayed, emotions can run hot. Tempers can run even hotter when claims of damage against steamship lines are denied or when cargo owners are called upon to participate in a general average, an ancient maritime concept that many are unfamiliar with. What do food and beverage cargo owners need to know when dealing with maritime complications? What maritime laws should they better understand? I'm Michael Lieberman, food and beverage practice leader at FOA and Sun Insurance Brokers, and this is Food for Thought. I am pleased to welcome Don Murnane and John Kerpusis to Food for Thought. Don and John are both partners at Freehill, Hogan & Mahar, a firm founded in 1952 with deep roots in maritime law. Don Murnane has been practicing maritime law for 30 years and is recognized as one of the top maritime and shipping litigation lawyers in the U.S. and internationally. He has acted as lead counsel in litigation and arbitration of all manner of maritime disputes, including vessel and terminal casualties, cargo defense, time and voyage charters, international commercial fraud, terminal, government, and liner service contracts. He is a graduate of the United States Merchant Marine Academy and served aboard ocean-going vessels as a deck officer. John Carpusis heads up the firm's workers' compensation practice and has consistently been ranked in best lawyers in America. Described as a litigator with fierce passion by a client, John has a wide range of expertise, including but not limited to labor law, Longshore Harbor Workers' Compensation, Maritime Personal Injury Law, Jones Act Claims, and Marine Insurance Coverage Disputes. 
Don and John, thank you so much for being my guest here today on Food for Thought. Great to be here, Michael. So let's start the discussion with a disclaimer. Uh, I'm, I'm all about making my guests as comfortable as possible. And considering that I have not only one attorney, but two, uh, I, I, I want to make sure that, that I'm very clear about something. I want to let the viewing audience know that anything that we speak on today is for informational purposes only. It should not be construed as legal advice. Uh, the situations that we are discussing are all evolving. Uh, many of the facts are still to be uncovered. John, Don, anything to add to that disclaimer? Yeah, I would just say that most of what we're talking about today, particularly the factual side and the status of the, of the casualty in Egypt, is based on news reports. We don't have any direct knowledge of um, the materials that, for instance, those that might be litigating the case eventually may have already, be that raw data from the, from the ship or testimony from those who were on the bridge of the ship. Um, so yeah, this is really sort of a 20,000. We're gonna go into some detail, which I think will make it helpful because there is quite a lot of detail, Michael, in the news. Um, but again, it's all secondhand and, and it should be taken with, with uh, a bit of a reservation as to its accuracy right now. Understood. John, you on board? Anything to add? I, I'm totally on board. Uh, and again, um, what we're doing here today is to, is to discuss issues, not give advice, and certainly um, just uh, to give, as Don said, an overview of what the law is. All right, great. All right, guys. Well, look, let's, let's rock and roll here. Um, so while there has been a myriad of maritime events over the past couple of years, uh, vessel fires, lost containers overboard uh, in the North Pacific uh, due to some of the rough seas that we saw this past fall and winter, uh, the headline event was the ever given clogging up the Suez Canal. Uh, many really wondered how in the world could this have happened uh, with an experienced captain, uh, with a canal pilot, did the size, we hear a lot these days about the size of these container ships just getting larger and larger. Did the size of the Ever Given have anything to do with the grounding? Uh, perhaps the weather. There were reports of strong winds. Uh, can, can you guys provide any technical aspects behind the grounding itself? So Michael, I'll start with the first question. And, and um, I've spent a little bit of time the last few days looking at the technical side of this. Um, we've handled cases like this for, for 30 years. So um, we know what to look for and sort of the peaks that, that are being examined um, at present. Again, we're way behind the curve. There are many investigations underway. Uh, the flag state, Panama, uh, for the vessel is conducting an investigation. Um, the canal authority itself is conducting an investigation that would uh, be somewhat um, of a unique investigation for some things we can touch on. IMO is looking into it. And most importantly, the private parties are all investigating this with their lawyers and their technical experts. Uh, but the short answer to your question is, how can this happen? Uh, it's not uncommon. Um, many ships ground uh, fairly regularly um, uh, in the world. And um, what makes this unique is that this vessel uh, decided to ground um, in a choke point um, uh, in one of the world's most uh, uh, significant commercial arteries and, and basically uh, stopped traffic in both directions. So that's what makes this unique. Uh, the ship wasn't really damaged um, in the incident. It was, I wouldn't say it's a soft grounding, but it was a grounding that's basically in sand and mud. The vessel was pinned across the canal. Uh, it, it could have been worse. You could have had a collision. You could have had a grounding on rocks with oil spills and so forth. Um, there are a number of factors involved. In, in any one of these cases, there's usually a series of events that lead to this result. And yes, weather is implicated. Navigation of the vessel is implicated. Passage planning, should the vessel have even attempted this, given the weather forecast at the time. These are all issues that are being examined. Um, but the short answer to your question is, until we know the facts of, of how it did happen, um, it's very difficult to say why it happened and where the faults are. 
from a high view, the initial things we've looked at, there's something called a VDR, a vessel data recorder. That's been posted on YouTube. That tr contains a tremendous amount of information. It's almost as you can take that data and almost as if you're in a drone watching the ship navigate through the canal, you can see exactly where she was and what happened, how the master conned the vessel, what he was doing, and he was snaking quite a bit in the canal. Uh, I say he, he's, he's working in concert with two pilots, not just one, there were two pilots on the vessel. And I think ultimately what will be very important apart from the data um, is there may be voice recordings of what was said on the bridge. So you will have, if those were recorded, um, and there are microphones over all over most of the bridges on these ships. This is a, a relatively new ship. I'd be surprised if there isn't some uh, voice uh, data. Um, and you'll, you may have discussions between the pilot and the master. You may have some heated discussions. Um, the, the canal authority has already pronounced that the ship is solely at fault, that the master was, was essentially over navigating, that he issued eight uh, rudder or um, engine commands in 12 minutes um, and that that's excessive. It's really not. Uh, it really depends um, on what was going on. So um, I think ultimately, if I, if I had to guess, this ship, which has a huge uh, sail area, she's very big, number one. She's big for the size of the canal. As she navigates in the canal, there's hydrodynamic forces that affect her because she's so large. It creates, and the passage of the ship in the waterway creates pressure either side of the ship, something called bow suction or cushion or stern suction or cushion. And if you have a wind that's very strong from the stern and catches the quarter of the vessel as she's maneuvering, that can cause her to lose maneuverability. So I think you're going to see some of that. There were reports of gusts up to 40 knots, which yeah. is a lot of wind for a ship this size. And again, she's very big. She's the maximum size for that transit. It happened six miles into her transit. She was in a convoy with other ships. Interestingly, one other ship was as big as her and apparently did not have problems. Um, so we'll have to see. This is going to go on for a long time. It's going to be every... Uh, detail will be looked in, in, in great with great scrutiny, um, but and, the jury's still out. And and Don, you said that there were not there were two pilots on that vessel. And from what I understand, and by no means am I an expert like you are, um, but it's my understanding that it's the Suez Canal that appoints the pilots onto these vessels as they go through. Is that correct? That's correct. So it's compulsory pilotage. Under the, the there's a 400-page booklet um, that the canal puts out that deals with the regulations as to use and navigation. There's a speed limit of of seven to eight knots. This ship was unquestionably going faster than that. Okay. Um, she she uh, the, it, it appears to me again, um, you know, it's speculation on my part, but the ship seems to have had some maneuverability problems as soon as she got into the canal, probably because of this wind. Mm -hmm. um, so with this very strong following wind, she was being pushed along and she veers. She's on the left-hand side of the channel when she originally goes in and she veers to the right, veers back to the left. And she's she's kind of snaking her way for six miles. And uh, we, we don't know why that is, but we can speculate. Uh, uh, and yes, there, there are two pilots on board and they are consulting with the master uh, but ultimately, the master has the final say. Don, I was going to ask, it, would it be worthwhile to maybe discuss a little bit um, the relationship with the of the pilots in terms of pilotage clauses and uh, indemnity uh, provisions vis-a-vis -vis the vessel owner and the pilots associations? I know from my experience locally in New York and uh, New Jersey um, that when pilots get on board, there's usually an indemnification provision that the, that the vessel has to give to the pilots association. And then the, really it's compulsory. You have to take who they give you. You, you, don't, you don't get to pick which pilot you get. So. Um, that, that's right. And what you're saying, um, John, is that if there's pilot error, they're really held harmless. 
I, you know, it, 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 it depends. I don't know what the pilotage clause says in the Suez Canal because, you know, we don't really deal with losses in the, in the, Suez, uh, in the Suez Canal. Um, but Don, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, so this one is fairly straightforward. Um, John is talking about what are the practices more commonly found here in the States. Uh, but in the Suez Canal, you are required to take a pilot um, you cannot transit without a pilot. It's mandatory. Um, you don't select who that is. Right. Obviously, if a pilot comes onto your ship before you enter the canal who's got an issue and the master detects that there's an issue, the master's within his rights to ask that the pilot be replaced. Um, here, though, the pilot becomes essentially the servant of the vessel, and the canal authority navigation regulations say that he is effectively an employee of the ship. He becomes um, one of the ship's uh, um, navigators or consultants, and they're not liable for his faults. Um, so, so it's all really, uh, this will be challenged, believe me, in a case like this, a lot of this will be scrutinized and challenged. Uh, but um, the, the basic overview is that the pilot becomes um, a, a servant of the vessel and, and the vessel and the vessel owner are responsible for the pilot's actions. Um, ultimately, the master has the final say. Um, and that's always a, you know, a, a dicey exchange or interplay between the master and the pilot. And as I said, the, the uh, SCA has come out, their main investigator has come out already and said, this is 100% fault of the master. He was over navigating. He was giving too many mm -hmm. uh, commands. Too, too quickly and didn't allow the vessel to respond before he, he gave another one. Um, you may have issues as to whether helm orders were executed properly by the person actually steering the ship. That can be an issue sometimes. Um, but but cer certainly a lot more to be uncovered. A lot more to be uncovered. This will go on, on for years. You'll have all of the people that were on the bridge will be deposed and they may have different views. Uh, there, there's radar information, there's data from the canal authority itself. The pilots will be deposed, the master, uh, right. the mates, uh, the engineers. So there's a lot, a lot that will go on yet. So Don, John, I read a report that 30%, um, I don't know how accurate this is, but 30% of all global container traffic passes through the Suez. Uh, the amount of trade that passes through also represents a tremendous amount of revenue to Egypt. Um, what are some of the uh, commercial aspects uh, or the commercial advantages of vessel canal usage? Uh, are, are the fees worth the time savings? Um, what type of additional liabilities do these ship owners have to the canal when they, when they do utilize the canal passage? Well, we've already touched on the compulsory pilot issue, issue that you have to, you have to use their pilots. They, you know, they have to come on board and and I think Don will probably expound a little bit more about the tariffs and the fees, uh, as well as yeah. the time saving, because if I'm not mistaken, Don, have you sailed through the through the uh, Suez? I've never been through the, the Suez. I've been through the Panama Canal several times. Right. Yeah. So, so Michael, you know, it's 50 ships a day um, that pass through the canal. Um, they're done in. Um, Convoys, there's two southbound convoys every day, one northbound convoy. It is a massive artery uh, for commerce between the Far East and Europe. So what's interesting here is most of these containers, and we've, we're talking about a ship that's got um, 20,000 total equivalent units. That's 20,000, this is her capacity, 20,000 20 foot containers, 10,000 40 foot, you might have multiple uh, cargo owning interests for each container. Everything that you see in, in the supermarket, everything that you see in Walmart, uh, anywhere in Europe is, is in those boxes. And the estimates are that three quarters of a billion dollars in value that's on that ship as she transit. So yeah, um, you know, and time is money, obviously. Um, just in time, is, is a big factor for a number of manufacturers and, and um, distributors. So um, they wouldn't go through there 
if it didn't save them money. Or uh, the the fees are astronomical. I've heard a quote that that for the ever given to pass through, it was seven hundred thousand uh, dollars in an, e an e easy pass toll. Wow. So, but they, they wouldn't do it if they wouldn't go that way if if it wasn't economical. And and of course, the Suez Canal is is a major historical uh, transportation uh, development. Prior to that, it was it was around uh, the Cape. And so what we had in this case is once the canal is closed, of course, ship owners are looking for what are my options now? And it really depends on where you were, where your ship was at the time of the grounding. If you were already in line to go through the canal, um, you had to make an estimate as to how long is this going to last? Does it make sense for us to, to skedaddle, turn around and, and, and make the long trip around? Uh, how much is that going to cost? How long is it going to take? And do that depends know, on. Do you know, Don, the, the amount of time? And I know it depends on where you were exactly when the Suez became blocked, but do you know the approximate time? Uh, yeah, it's. If you go the long way? If you go the long way, I mean, a tanker is going to move much more slowly than, than one of these ships or, or uh, you know, a vessel that travels faster, but it's anywhere from, depending where you are, 11 days to 26 days, it could add. Um, it depends where you're going as well in, in Europe, but um, yeah. And believe me, the market weighs this, you know, and the canal weighs it. The canal does knows how much it costs for a ship to go around, and that affects the, the, the cost of, of the toll, um, but tremendous toll, <laughs> tremendous, toll. Um, tremendous toll. And I've seen the same, you know, quotes, 12% uh, to 28% of, of uh, the world's commerce is, is passing through that, that artery. Um, that's what makes this case so interesting, uh, is the significance of the canal. I mean, when it and comes to, closing it. When it comes to the potential liabilities that ship owners face when passing through the canal, do you think that mm -hmm. someone has gone through the process of identifying that risk of what would happen if that vessel clogged the canal and what that would mean from an economic liability standpoint? Uh, or is this truly a black swan event that no one thought about? Well, it's, it's happened before. There was a war where the, where the canal was closed. Um, and, and, you know, historically there have been uh, periods of time um, and, you know, I believe that was in the 70s it had a tremendous impact, but it is very hard to predict because you don't know how long it's going to last. Um, here the, the stoppage was six plus days. That's actually a fairly um, good result for what happened. It could have been a lot worse. Um, but um it's it's just so hard there are so many factors to try to calculate uh when something like this happens the numbers are astronomical the knock-on effect of 100 ships uh being um you know put into a, a waiting line basically on both ends and then um how those ships being unable to transit affects other commerce um and it's the the, the uh, tentacles that go out from this incident, if if you were to try and map it, it would it would encompass the globe, um, because there's so many knock-on effects in terms of the product, the ships, and the end businesses that are involved. So so Don and John, um, what claims will the ever given face? I mean, this has now happened, right? And and they're facing claims um, currently, and I'm sure they're gonna face some future claims. Uh, I know there's no crystal ball here, but what are your thoughts as far as the claims that they're gonna to, to encounter? Well, it, it's, it's easy to say at the, at the start that we know one thing that they're not gonna face is these kind of economic loss damages from cargo owners, unless there's an injury, a, a physical injury to property, you know, you're not going to be able to get, you know, get the inconvenience, long way around inconvenience uh, type of claim back. Right. So uh, let's so let's talk about that. Let's just make because you know the audience here, they are cargo owners, 
right? And right. I think that's what we have seen. The biggest impact of cargo owners was not so much that there was an event that caused physical loss or damage to that cargo. The cargo arrived, the cargo was in sound condition. May not be the case for goods with short shelf life, perishables, um, but for the most part, lack of physical damage to the cargo, there was just a significant delay, right? So cust you know, owners of cargo, they had problems with maybe their customers not being able to make just on time deliveries. Those claims are really something that, as you said, John, would would not be something that cargo owners could claim against steamship lines. Yeah, it, it, at least under U.S. law. Bear in mind that that the you know this casualty that we're talking about here today probably you know is going to not going to have any U.S. law implications. Don, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, you know, the, the rule, it's a, it's a Supreme Court case from the 20s. It's Robbins Dry Dock case. If you, if you don't suffer a physical loss, you can't, you can't get purely economic delay type damages. Um, there was recently a case I was reading about in the Fifth Circuit, uh, which is in New Orleans, where a vessel hit a bridge, the bridge got knocked out, and all these residents had to take the long way around, and they sued the vessel. For, because of inconvenience, essentially, and the, the court kicked him out and said, you, you know, you, you don't get that kind of damage unless you're physically harmed or your property has suffered a physical harm. Understood. And that's so what other, what other type of claims do you, do you guys so, are, are coming down the pike for ever given? So, so Michael, let me just take where from what John said and, and um, amplify a little bit. You need to be very precise about the nature of the claim here. Um, let's talk about cargo claims. <clears throat> if you are a cargo owner and had your cargo on that ship, um, the area John was speaking of isn't going to apply because that's a tort area. So now you're looking at your bill of lading. You have a contract of carriage with the ship owner. And that contract of carriage here is likely, in my view, to be governed by something called the Hague Visby rules. And those are the, the sister uh, uh, legislation to US COGSA, Carriage of Goods by Sea Act. Mm -hmm. And that sets forth a scheme of liability for the ship owner. And here, um, the big issues are going to be error of navigation, which is a defense under COGSA and whether there was unseaworthiness of the vessel. So is there some condition uh, that the owner either knew of or should have known about um, at the commencement of the voyage that caused or contributed to this grounding? And so far, um, again, this is speculation, but most of what I've seen points not to any unseaworthiness, but to navigation. So failing to account for weather on your voyage, failing to make a proper passage plan, uh, failure of the master to say on that morning, it's too windy, I'm not going, okay? Those are navigational, um, arguably those are navigational decisions for which the owner would be uh, exonerated. Uh, there, was a, there were other ships that decided not to go in this morning, by the way. Uh, at least that's reported. Now, if there's a mechanical failure on the ship or if the crew is incompetent, then those are um, events, those are causes that will uh, negate, for the most part, any um, exoneration of the ship. Um, you, ra you raised earlier, Michael, a very good point. As a general matter, delay, pure delay under the bill of lading under COGS, so the ships do not promise, um, you know, a, a, a strict time uh, delivery. That's one of the vicissitudes of going to sea. They're very regular, but they don't promise uh, that there won't be delay. Where you have physical damage, however, to perishables because of the delay, then you're, then you're gonna have claims that, that have to be dealt with. Um, other claims to think about, the ship's gonna face a claim from the canal for lost revenue. That's at one point it was 950 million or something. That's been reduced. That, that included 300 million in loss of business reputation. That's apparently been backed out in the negotiations. 
it's down to 550 million, I believe, is, is the demand from the, uh, from the canal. And, and on that point, I guess it's now, I mean, that was an astonishing number when I saw that come out in the news. Uh, right. But I guess it is understandable considering that the toll, as you put it, Don, could be as high as $700,000 per vessel, right? So Yes. So if you've got 50 ships at multiple hundred thousands uh, per copy uh, a day and you go six days, the number gets up pretty high, uh, pretty quick. And the canal has seized the vessel. They've arrested the vessel. They're holding it there and the cargo. So you've got a hundred million dollar plus asset of a vessel. You've got three quarters of a billion dollars in cargo that, that's sitting there um, under arrest. And the ship can't leave and won't leave, can't get out of the canal until um, some sort of a security arrangement has been um, set up with the canal. So uh, I, would love, I would love to talk a little bit more specifically about perishables. Um, you know, not only are the, uh, the viewers of this series, or at least this episode, owners of cargo, many of them tend to be in the food and beverage business. So we are dealing in some cases with perishable cargo. Um, Don, you said that you know, if there's delay and then there's damage to those perishables, that there will be claims. Um, in many cases, at least the cargo owners, it's their belief that, hey, we have a negligent, that's to be debated, but we have a negligent steamship line. They didn't deliver our cargo. There was a delay. Uh, my product spoiled, um, or there was a loss of market. You know, they, they couldn't get, you know, the peak value for the goods because they couldn't deliver on time. What are some of the maritime laws or, or scenarios such as, you know, pilot error, mechanical error? I, I know you talked about that some about that previously that may protect the vessel owner. And are there scenarios where the cargo owners would have a legitimate claim and perhaps get recovery from the steamship line? Like, can you distinguish that for us? Yeah, I think it has to be parsed out though, Don, right? Uh, uh, that in between, you know, cargo that's on the ship versus cargo that's affected because the canal is closed. So let's talk about cargo that's on the ship. All right, so cargo that's on the ship is again, going to be governed by an evergreen bill of lading or another carrier's bill of lading because many times now there's sharing arrangements where multiple carriers will will have issued bills of lading for that particular vessel. And again, you have to be careful with the analysis here. The question of liability, val not, liability or not under COGSA, that's the initial question, is the ship liable? Let's take an example. If error of navigation is shown to be the sole cause of what happened here, the ship owner's out, it's exonerated, whether you have damage or not, okay? The ship owner is not liable if it sustains a, an enumerated defense under COGSA. Got it. Game over, ship owner wins, okay? If, however, the vessel is found to be at fault under COGSA, one of the, it doesn't qualify for one of those exceptions, or it was found to be unseaworthy, and that the unseaworthiness caused the damage to the cargo, then we get into this issue. And so if your cargo isn't physically damaged, it's just delayed, you're not generally gonna be able to recover. If, however, the delay causes a perishable good to become damaged, then you have a claim and that's, that's a valid claim that has to be looked at in terms of um, how much is the loss. So was the shelf life of the product diminished? Did the product spoil? Did they lose um, value because the market um, transitioned during the delay? And those are all valid claims that have to be evaluated and looked at in the, in the normal course. And I think that's a really important point for cargo owners to understand because when they look at their own protection through their marine cargo policy, what many cargo owners will find is a paramount exclusion for delay, right? Marine cargo underwriters, they do not want to pay losses due to delay alone. Um, so it's good to know that there may be some recourse against the steamship lines for certain types of losses when it comes to delay and loss of perishables. 
Um, now, of course, as a broker and advocate for insureds, I'm always trying to get carbacks for that delay exclusion. So if there is damage due to delay, then the insurance policy will back that up. Um, but I think that's a really important point for uh, cargo owners to understand that you know this could be an uninsured risk within their own policy, but there may be different avenues for recovery through the steamship line. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, that, that's right. Most of the time, we when we are defending the ship owners, our opponents are uh, cargo uh, recovery lawyers who are representing the cargo underwriter in a recovery posture. So. Uh, yeah, the, you know, if whatever the policy pays out, it pays out to the uh, insured, and then those claims are subrogated, and that's when we get into these COGSA issues. Great. Um, now, if, if we're faced with a situation where the vessel is found to be negligent, are there any other things that are protecting the vessel from liability, such as a, a limit of liability. Um, another important fact for cargo owners to understand is that while you may be able to prove negligence, you may have a valid claim, you may not be entitled to 100% of the value of your goods because of a limited liability that the vessel owner has in place. Does that exist? Yeah, a couple points here. First of all, you said if the ship is negligent. Um, again, negligence alone might not be enough. If the ship is negligent in, in her navigation, um, that, that might be, you know, uh, an excuse. If the ship is unseaworthy and the ship is found to have breached COGSA or the Hague-Visby requirements, um, then we, we get into this, this issue of limitation. In the U.S., the famous uh, limitation is the COGS of $500 package limit. I'd be surprised if that has much application on this case because, again, most of these containers are going into Europe, and I suspect we're going to have Hague-Visby. And so there's a different limit that applies under Hague-Visby, and that's a fairly complicated calculation involving... Uh, you know, various international currencies and, and, and the amount of cargo. It's not the $500 package. So that's one limit. Then there's a, another limit, and the ship owners have already filed in London um, for uh, a ship owner's limitation of liability under international treaty and English law, which would limit um, the ship owner's overall liability uh, to a fund of about 114 million. In the U.S., um, under limitation law, personal contracts are excluded from that limit. You cannot contract with someone and say, I'm going to do something, and then file a limitation action and say, well, I breached my contract, you know, the limit applies. So I'm not sure, the, I'm pretty sure the English position is the same. So if you have a bill of lading contract with the ship owner, and the ship owner files a limitation act somewhere in the world, um, usually those contractual obligations would not be subject to the limit. So when it comes to the ever given, just a quick question, um, because I want to I start talking about general average. Was general average declared on the ever given? It has been declared. It has been declared. Okay. So what I've recognized over my career is that clients or cargo owners, they are caught off guard when they are brought into a general average. It's a, it's a concept that is foreign to many cargo owners. Um, I personally believe that the general average risk on its own is sufficient reason for cargo owners to maintain uh, some level of marine cargo insurance uh, because these policies will respond to, to claims of GA. Um, can you provide, John, Don, an explanation on general average or GA? Um, and how it works. Well, I, I'm going to defer to Don because he's done far more general average than I have. Be, it, it doesn't happen often, but but I, I, I'm going to defer to Donnie on this one. Doesn't doesn't happen often, but I I've seen more declarations of GA over the past couple months. Than well, because we've had a lot of it, we've had a lot of container overboard types case, type of cases, right? We've had a lot of container losses and things like that. 
Um, I think there was there was a recent recent G8 declared. I forget the name of the vessel, but there was a you know there was an engine fire. Um, I don't think it was a huge event. You know the the vessel made it to to port, um, but GA was declared, and I got a couple calls from clients saying, "What is this?" <laughs> right. So any explanation you guys can provide in layman's terms on what is general average, how it works, would be greatly appreciated. It's like a pot, right, Don? It's like a like the, the pot of money, right? Well. It's general average is a, a very arcane um, sub specialty uh, within maritime law. Um, there are average adjusters who are, are um, experts in this, but there are some overriding legal principles. And the essential theme of it is that the venture, the vessel and her cargo um, are uh, exposed to a risk that threatens loss of uh, the venture. And we all are all in this together for better, for better or, or worse. And so we need to contribute together in this venture that we're in to save it. Um, and so there are general average contributions that are sought by the owner. You can come and get your cargo if you want to get it off, but you're going to secure your general average contribution before you get your cargo. Um, and then uh, the salvage aspects are worked into that. If the ship is has to be salvaged, um, there are contributions to that. Um, that hey, you're you, you have cargo on the ship, you're in the venture with us, and we should all contribute to that. So it's it's that is the essence of it. Um, Ultimately, um, it goes into a process, a general average adjustment, uh, where the uh, insurance experts, the adjusters will come in and, and do the adjustment, but it's all subject to legal challenge. Um, there are issues of vessel fault. Uh, there's something, there's a unique clause in many charter parties or bills of lading called the Jason clause, which basically says, yeah, okay, general average, uh, has been declared, but you're not entitled ship owner to general average because you're at fault for this. And the uh, Jason clause essentially says, well, as long as the ship owner has defenses under COGS or Hague rules, then the general average uh, declaration will, will remain in place and the contributions will be required. Very complicated, esoteric area, but the basic principle is that we're all in this together and everyone's going to contribute uh, to it. Uh, and then there's an adjustment and the numbers are worked out and most of it gets settled. John, any, anything to add to that? No, as I said, Don is, uh, is done more, far more general average cases than I've ever deemed to know about. So right. I've, I've, I've been in situations where uh, cargo owners, you know, they may sell their goods to a customer on CFR terms, but guess what? They work out payment terms where they don't get money for those goods until the goods are actually delivered to the customer's location. Um, so you have a situation where the, the, the buyer has risk of loss, has title to the product, but the seller doesn't yet have the money for the goods. And then when a GA is declared, the customer who should be held responsible to participate in that GA says, you know what? I don't have the goods. I haven't paid for the goods. <laughs> Goes it back on the seller. So it's a really interesting, you know, concept to consider when dealing with what Inco terms our shippers are, are, you know, sellers using when selling goods. Um, mm -hmm. What payment terms are they yep. using? Um, you know, if you don't have your money and you don't have title to the goods, it could create a very complicated situation, uh, especially when it comes to a GA. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate the layman's explanation, Don, very much. And I'm sure the audience does as well. Um, so guys, look, I, I, I thank you so much for your time today. Uh, but what I, what I always like to do with each episode and each topic that we cover on these episodes is to really try to give the audience some clear takeaways. Um, so from a, a cargo owner's perspective, uh, as we still find ourselves in this very active maritime event state, which I hope settles down soon, um, what are some of the lessons learned? 
Uh, and what are some steps or corrective actions that cargo owners, food and beverage cargo owners, uh, should be focusing on right now? Um, so I'm not sure that this really changes a whole lot. Um, I don't know that there are too many lessons that can be learned from it. It is a highly unique event. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a one in a million shot, but it's, it's not going to happen every day. That's why we're talking about it. Um, make sure you, you you have adequate insurance is, is the takeaway. Um, you can't always insure uh, for, for everything. That's, that's some of a unique part of, of the maritime world. Um, there are, there are risks that, um, are going to occur. You know, the closing of the Suez Canal is, is an extremely rare event. Um, but I think the main takeaway is understand as best you can uh, what your contractual obligations and rights are. It, it's helpful to spend time looking into these issues so that you're not surprised when, when you have an incident like this. And, um, you know, it helps you plan. Um, can, can a small company, can a, an importer of perishables have as part of its risk management plan, what happens when the Suez Canal is closed? Probably not realistic. It just doesn't happen that often. But what happens when we have a large casualty where, where our, our products are delayed and, and we've got obligations to distributors or, or to our own customers? I think that's, worth, that's definitely worth something uh, to plan for. Very, very valuable. Thank you for that. Uh, John, anything to add as we close nope. this episode out? Nope. Thank you for having us, Michael. We, uh, it, was, uh, it was fun and informative, I think. I hope it was at least. All right. I, well, le I learned a lot just listening to Don. <laughs> that's, that, that's right. Well, I'm, I'm glad we could teach you something, John. Absolutely. But look, I really appreciate uh, the time and the energy that both of you put into this. John, I know you're traveling down in uh, Dallas right now, so thank know. you very much. My pleasure. Um, but take care, and perhaps we'll have you back for a follow-up episode. Appreciate you very much. That'd be great. If, if, if any of the seamen had been injured, Mr. Carpusas would be answering most of the questions, not me. That's, that's probably Just right. the way it is. Well, we're thankful that the seamen were not injured right. in, in this event. That's right. um, gents, take care. Okay, thanks, thanks Michael. Michael. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Thanks to everyone for joining us here on Episode 8 of Food for Thought. My deep appreciation goes out to our guests, Don Bernane and John Kapusis of Freehill, Hogan, and Mahar. And as I always close, thank you to all of our Fulla & Son valued clients for allowing us to serve your risk management and insurance needs. It's our honor to play a role in your food and beverage journey and your success. I'll see you next time on Food for Thought. Okay, well, welcome back everyone to the live Q&A. Um, I know Patty Devine was uh, monitoring any questions that came in. We're going to have Don and John. I see that John's camera is back on. John, hopefully your audio is back on. And, and Don, I know you're calling in from a remote, very remote location. If you could switch that camera on, I see you're still there. But switch the camera on and, and turn your audio on, and we'll we'll jump into this. Uh, I do know that uh, we. You, you there? You there, Don? I am. The audio is fine, but it says cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. Okay. Well, we'll see if we can get the host to. Uh, oh, there he is. There he is. Sandra, fix something. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> All right. Well, I know we hit them before we get into some questions. I know we hit a milestone in the Ever Given case. We here we are in late June, 2021. The grounding happened what back in. March, correct? And, and yeah, three, three months ago. And Don, you sent me an email this morning with that milestone. And maybe you can give a little bit of uh, an update. <clears throat> sure, I'd be happy to. So the, the ship owner has been in negotiations with the um, uh, canal authority. As, as we discussed in the video, the vessel was seized by the authority and there were demands made for security. Um, and it's been three months. Um, I'm sure those have been some, you know, very um, intense negotiations. Uh, but the report as of this morning is that a deal has been struck. The vessel will be allowed to leave security 
arrangements have been worked out. The details of that were not made public. So we don't know how much in terms of quantum um, the ship owner has posted, uh, but the vessel will now uh, go on to uh, Rotterdam um, and discharge the cargo there. Um, so that, that's a big development, but it, it did take uh, three months uh, to work this out. It's, in, it's incredible. They, well, the, the cargo will be discharged, but I would assume that cargo owners need to put up the uh, general average security in order to get their cargo, correct? That's correct. So there, there will be security posted for whatever the um, anticipated contributions will be. Um, it. And it always going to be significant. Feels, it always feels good to have your cargo tied up for three months and then have to put up security to actually get your cargo. So, so, so frustrations are, uh, are, are high right now, especially in the world of shipping, because it's so difficult out there, even under you know, good conditions. Um, Patty, did we, uh, I know you were monitoring Facebook Live. Uh, any questions come through? We do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one today, gentlemen, is COGSA. I don't know what the acronym stands for, I'm sorry. Seems to be one of the main laws that cargo owners should familiarize themselves with. Is this an international law or does it only pertain to shipments imported into the US? My lawyer friends, I'll leave that in your so hands. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, the questioner obviously knows uh, some of some of the um, issues here. Um, I doubt that U.S. COGSA. I, we don't we don't know. We have to look at the bills of lading. But because most of this cargo was going from Asia into Europe, as we discussed in the video, I suspect uh, most of it will be subject to the Hague rules. Um, that I could be wrong on that too. On some of these containers, some uh, ship owners have have amended their bill of lading. Um, they may have a service contract that requires a different uh, regime to apply, but generally COGS applies to bills of lading for cargo going to or from the U.S. Um, that's exproprio vigore or by operation of law. Um, and it can also apply by contract. The parties can stipulate to that. But I, I really doubt that the U.S. lawyers are going to have much to do. There may be some boxes that were ultimately um, going to be transshipped that might have U.S. COGS, but I think that the vast majority of these boxes are going to be um, Hague Visby or something other than U.S. COGS. I should have mentioned too. There's there's new legislation that's been in the works for many years now. It, it hasn't gotten final traction, called the Rotterdam Rules, and those rules have adjusted some of these arcane um, uh, principles under the old, um, um, you know exoneration for navigation and such. Those have all been looked at and modified under the Rotterdam rules. Great, thank you so much. Um, Brad actually has a question. The owners who have perishables, are they able to make claims under general average? Um, so they would be responsible to contribute um, in general average, if the, I'm trying to understand the question, if, if the cargo has perished, if it's valueless at this point, um, and I don't know that to be the case, then obviously there's no incentive to contribute to GA if you're not going to get your cargo or you don't want it. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but. Um, well, I think, Don, let me, let, me, let me jump in on that. Because I think where there's confusion is that from a cargo owner's perspective, if their cargo is damaged, does, that, does the value of their damaged cargo become part of the general average calculation? And would cargo owners receive it, funds from that general average? Yeah, I don't, I, you know, this is all in the York Antwerp rules, and this is part of the rather sophisticated calculation that goes on. I think we would need to see the, the, the particular documents involved here. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Something for us to definitely look into. 
but great, great question uh, for sure. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. We've got one more and we'll get everybody out of here by one o'clock, um, providing you guys can answer this quickly. So um, I guess there's just a lot, a strong resistance when asking steamship lines for temperature data um, on refrigerated containers. And um, so when, when temp abuses do occur, um, you know, the, the uh, client has to provide the, the temp data, but when they ask for theirs, there's strong resistance to that. So how do we get that uh, data released? Yeah, this is, that, that's a great question. I'm curious who asked that. Um, something that, that really drives cargo owners up a wall is when there is a temperature related loss. I mean, I've seen this time and time again. And the surveyor who is uh, appointed by the steamship line uh, will ask the cargo owner, you know, did you have your own time temperature recording devices within that container? The cargo owner answers, yes, we do. Would you like that data? Hands over the data. And then in return, we ask the surveyor, oh, can we get our hands on the steamship lines uh, data in regards to temperature? And we are regularly met with, oh, that's private information. <laughs> we don't release that information. Um, so do you guys have any familiarity with that situation? Is there a solution? I have a lot of familiarity with it. Um, I've looked at thousands of microprocessing data loggers. Um, they are, um, they can be frustrating for a ship owner because uh, you'll have alarms going off that don't really mean anything. Um, and so I think there's some hesitancy in some cases where ship owners are hesitant to provide that because there, there can be some uh, basis for complaining about how the unit performed where in fact there was no real causative impact on the cargo. But the short answer is if you're in federal court in the United States, you have discovery, those are, those are discoverable um, and, and you'll get them. Um, usually they're in my practice over the years, they've been provided for the most part um, to the claimant's attorneys and uh, they're very much a part of the discussion and trying to get, get the cases resolved. And most of the carriers wanna resolve these cases and the folks on the perishable side most carriers really want to do a good job for you. Um, and I know there are some arcane principles that are involved here. There's some great stories about federal judges who, who find out about these defenses and, and it's a learning experience for them as well. But overall, your, your, your high-end carriers, they know that the lifeblood is, is to satisfy their customers and that's what they're trying to do. Um, and uh, overall, they do a pretty good job. And John, you, you seem like you want to jump in with some comments. I, I mean, I would just go one step further to, and amplify what Don said is that, you know, when you're in federal court, uh, as you would be under a COGSA claim, uh, you, you have an obligation to provide it what, what's called an initial disclosure. Uh, and so it, most of the times you're going to be provided with the information that, that we're talking about as part of the initial disclosures. So you get that stuff early on in the litigation. Well, gentlemen, look, we are and, at the, and the other thing now. Go, go ahead, please. We'll Sorry. let it run past one hour. It's fine. Yeah, just, no one, no one's watching us. <laughs> just, just real quick, just real quick. Um, a lot of people, a lot of um, uh, of these cases, they don't even get to the lawyers. So most of the time, the stuff is exchanged. There's, there's not a lot of incentive for this to go to litigation. So. Uh, I think with a lot of the major carriers, this a lot of this information is voluntarily exchanged. Very good. Unfortunately, right, Don? <laughs> it doesn't you go to litigation, right? unfortunately. <laughs> you got it. That's right. Unfortunately, right. Well, look, if, if you can't make your money with cases, you can make your money doing these type of webinars. We're going to have to pay you next time. That's right, guys. So look, look I, I just want to thank you, Don, John, such amazing content uh, for our audience. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to all of our viewers. Uh, please keep an eye out for news on our next episode of Food for Thought, which will be taking place uh, later on next month. Uh, we're going to be uh, in the month of July. Can't believe time is flying. Um, but anyhow, signing off for now. And, uh, and thanks to everyone. And Patty, thank you for putting this all together. Much appreciated. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having us, Michael. Thanks very much. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.
Bye bye. Thanks all. Bye bye. Bye. Do, do.